I bet we're live. Well, hello and welcome to the Photo Brigade podcast. I'm Robert Kaplan. Today I've got my friend and repeat guest, Mark Koslerich. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, it's great to have you back. Um, now you're a couple years into your stint here in New York City as a freelance photographer. And um, most recently you've been named a National Geographic Explorer, yep. which is congratulations are Thank due you. for that. That's awesome. Thank you. And we'll talk more about that um, in just a second. But as always, I just want to say thank you to Adorama for letting us use the, their event space to record these podcasts almost every Friday, almost every Friday. Um, and uh, also for the live events that we have, you can check those live events out on our Facebook page, uh, Photo, uh, Photo Brigade on Facebook. Um, also check out our Instagram and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Also, thanks to uh, Canon Professional Services and Temba Bags for your support. You guys rock. So... Uh, <laughs> he yeah, turns around and he's like, here's the logo for you. Yeah. Um, so, Mark, uh, like I said, you're two years into your, your freelancing here. Yep. How has it been? You're, you're a graduate from uh, Missouri. Yep. Master's degree at Missouri. Oh, you got a master's degree. Yep. Okay. Uh, University of Wisconsin was my undergrad. That's so, right. Yeah. And it was political science, was it? Political science and Middle East studies. Middle so, East studies. Yeah. Oh, wow. So I'm... I'm kind of obviously not the middle east studies stuff yet although i'm still interested in the region but i'm i'm trying to take the stuff that i was interested in the things that i was interested in from my time in undergrad and my growing up in wisconsin um and sort of take that and add it on to the skills that i've learned as a journalist and and meld those together that's great that's really yeah. great um and how did you find that transition coming into from a, a student, albeit a master's degree student, coming into freelancing in, in the city here? Because one of the most expensive cities in the world to live. Yeah. Uh, and journalism, one of the least lucrative yeah. forms of uh, photography. Um, how, how's that transition been for you? So it was really funny when I was in grad school, um, I, I looked I, I knew there were a lot of photographers in New York and there were a lot of photographers in New York who I was never seeing work from and I had no idea how that that part of the career actually worked I, I didn't know what the market was I didn't know how anybody made a living mm -hmm. I'm not necessarily saying that I completely understand it now even though I'm doing it myself but um, I so I benefited from having some freelancing going on when I was in Missouri uh, I covered the protests in Ferguson for Reuters for about a week um, and then a lot of the aftermath for the New York Times and some for Reuters and then a bunch of other stories in Missouri for for the New York Times some election stuff like midterm election stuff for Reuters and so I in my second year of grad school I was fully supporting myself on a Missouri budget as a freelancer for these international clients um, that really helped when I moved to New York I think at least I had some um, some cachet with certain clients I had some relationship that I could could work off of and get me to the next step right on right on um, I want to uh, show some of your work uh, that you've been doing and this is this is the work that you are are doing with the National Geographic so this is this is all work that I did on my own before I submitted to the National Geographic um, Society grant program. But it is the stuff that got me the grant, and it's the basis for the work that I'll be doing in the future. So yeah. it's the same region and same issues. So so explain to me um, first of all what it is that gave you this title as National Geographic Explorer. It, it, it's an, a grant, you say? Yeah, it's a grant, and um, so I you submit this grant grant proposal it's like a small thesis you have to cite your sources on a lot of the claims that you're making whether it's uh, statistics or um, citing previous work and so I was working off of a sort of a long history of photographers working in the rural Midwest and the Great Plains and so I was citing a lot of their work um, as saying like hey we've talked about specifically in this this context rural issues and um, before, but it's been a long time since there's been a, a deep dive, say for one or two other photographers, and, and we need to start talking more about rural issues. Um, that was 
that was basically the concept. Now the 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 umbrella for it, the hook was I was traveling covering the presidential election mm-hmm. and um, doing thousands of miles on the road, and I, I sort of noticed that the backbone of the U.S. infrastructure now is gas stations and McDonald's. They hmm. seem to be everywhere that you go. Um, from A to B, it seemed to be the only places that I stopped besides the campaign events. And I thought, well, okay, if, if McDonald's represents this ubiquitous access to goods and services and jobs for some people, um, and you seem to be able to find them everywhere, then somewhere in the U.S. there's a place that's the farthest place from a McDonald's. Uh-huh. That is the exact opposite of that. Uh-huh. It's the There's a lack of access to medical care, goods, services, jobs, um, education. And so I found the place that in 2009 was the farthest place from a McDonald's, and that was my hook. I went out there thinking I was going to do like a lighthearted sort of fun project about this rural area, and I started to realize there's a lot of issues happening in rural America um, that people aren't talking about, and and what that does for the people that still live in rural places, 18% of the U.S. population that still lives in a rural area, they feel ignored, they feel isolated, mm-hmm. um, and I think that also contributes to where we are as a country. Um, so I wanted to start digging deeper into some of these issues, and that's how I started doing this project in more depth. I've spent 30 days in South Dakota over the last year. Are, so are all of these these photos from South Dakota then? Yep, and, and almost every single one of them is from one county. Um, there's maybe one or two that's slightly over the border into another county, but it's literally one county, Perkins County, that's lost 74% of its population in the last 100 years, and they've lost, lost 50% of their population in the last... 50 years and when you're isolated when you're two and a half hours from affordable groceries or specialized medical care uh, mental health services when you're that isolated the main resource that you have is the community right and so it's it's a project about the impact of population loss at that scale and the impact of isolation on these communities abilities to sustain themselves but we also have to look at it in terms of what rural communities like this provide for the nation um, and and trying to make people understand that their issues are not just um, on to them alone it's it's for all of us to try to think about rural communities as a part of a broader umbrella mm-hmm. and so you mentioned that you did this all on your own you decided just to take how much time did you take off of work here in the city and just to hit the road every time I went on a trip it was I'd lose 15 to 20 days worth of potential work in, in New York. So I'd fly to Green Bay. I'd drive two days drive to South Dakota. I, my, my family lives in Wisconsin still, and there's a, a car that I can use there. So instead of renting a car and flying somewhere, sure, I'd drive. So that's three days, the flight, two days of driving, I'd spend 10 days out there, then two days of driving back, the flight the next day. So it's like 16 days every time. And so, yeah, there were times where I got phone calls for jobs and I just, even even if I told the editors I was going to be gone, because it always hits you in the stomach when somebody asks you to do something. Oh, yeah. Turning and, down work is never fun. And so I tell people I'm gone. Please don't call me so I don't feel bad that I'm missing work and they, people would still call me. So I, I missed out on a lot of potential work. Um, I kept my overhead low and I really dedicated my time um, to this because I thought it was important. And I think... Um, it, it pays off in a different way. So where did you stay? What did you eat while you were on these roads? If, if you didn't have the option of McDonald's or... Yeah, um, so I stayed, um, I stayed with a friend when I'd drive through Minneapolis. And then when I got there, the first trip, I had talked, I literally knew one person there um, through Facebook, um, Andrea Block and her partner Shiloh um, own the nearest bar to that farthest point and I had talked to Andrea on Facebook and I said you know I don't know where I'm going to stay I can't afford there's like one hotel 30 minutes away and I said I can't afford even a small hotel do you think I could camp out back of the bar and they said oh. yeah sure you can do that that would be fine and I showed up and the first night I was there, there was a, some there were some folks at the bar that said, oh, we heard about you. Like, if you need a place to stay, we've got a, a place for the night. And then by the next day they said, okay, well, 
good seeing you. Talk to you later. And so I thought, well, I'll camp like I had planned to. And I showed back up at the bar, and Andrea was working, and she said, well, Shiloh and I talked, and we've decided you're not an axe murderer. <laughs> so y you can stay in our spare room. And that's literally what they said. And so I've been staying most of the time. Occasionally I'll stay overnight at a person's house if I'm spending a lot of time with them. But yeah. most of the time I'm staying with the owners of this bar, eating at the bar um, a lot. I probably put on some weight every time I go out there because I'm eating two meals a day at the bar when bar they're food. open. Is this the bar? Yeah. So this is the bar, Smokies. Um, and they make the best prime rib I've ever had. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's super cheap when you're used to living in New York. I'll spend 10 days out there and I'll spend between food and alcohol, I'll spend $200. Uh -huh. um, and, you know, I, at the end of the day, there's not much to do but sit and hang out and drink. So, um, wow. Yeah. That's that's really cool. And and I and I, I get a sense of, you know, sort of intimacy that you have with all of these people. And um, what is I guess w when I've been on assignment, as you have for different publications like The Times or, or whoever, you go in saying, hi, I'm with mm -hmm. such and such. I'm doing this story. It's going to be published here. Yeah. When you're doing your own project like this and you go into these people's lives who, like you said, feel neglected, have you found difficulty or has it been sort of like the opposite where they feel like oh wow I finally get a little bit of attention to bring some light to our stories so so there's two parts of this like first of all I really have to thank Andrea and Shiloh and then uh, everybody else that they've introduced me to who has introduced me to somebody else I mean I think it's such a small community the county has 2,400 people, but that's one person per square mile or so. Mm -hmm. um, and so this town that the bar is in has 31 people. The next nearest town has 300 people. They're small communities. Um, and so I, I think once one person knows and can vouch for you, that's that's the main thing. But um, it's I, people have been super open to me, but the one thing that I have to really think about and pay attention to is I'm not only like I'm representing their story but on the flip side I'm sort of I think about myself as sort of a representative of the journalistic community and and sort of an evangelist for journalism and mm -hmm. also for like people that live in large cities and so part of the way that I feel like I build intimacy with people is um, a give and take I'm, I'm telling them something about myself my background, seeing a lot of these issues um, in Wisconsin and being aware of them, but also like what my life is like in New York, what it's like being a journalist working for these publications. And a lot of people maybe wouldn't trust these publications. Yeah, that's what I was going to say is that this is obviously rural America. This is where, where a lot of folks, you know, mm -hmm. feel a bit jaded by the yeah. media or, you know. So I can talk them through my process. I can talk them through what my experience working for the New York Times or CNN or, or some of these places that I think for more conservative areas sort of have like a, a bad. Um, by the way, this taste. is a beautiful photo. Thank you. Like this just seems like right out of the Wizard of Oz or something. Yeah. I, when I saw this situation, I, I immediately thought of there's a famous photo that Jim Richardson took of two ranchers looking over a sky that's like this with some uh, um, with a farm implement over to the side and he was on assignment for Nat Geo, uh -huh. you know, probably 35 years ago or something like that. Yeah. And, and you see that and you sort of, it's a place that has a lot of nostalgia and, and people say, well, it, it doesn't look any different than what I've seen before. And so that's part of kind of part the, of point. the story. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, people there, you know, they have access to high speed internet and they get Amazon prime and stuff like that. So obviously the world has changed. Um, agriculture has changed, but, um, but some things sort of stay the same. And, and if you can play off people's nostalgia for these things, I think that really can hook people in. Um, but yeah, going back to about working, working for these places and talking to these people, I can tell them, you know, I've never worked for C CNN and, and felt like they were saying, you gotta be, got to nudge this story a little more towards the anti somebody angle or do something right. else. It's, and that's not how it works. And I think people misunderstand how journalism works. So I, I provide about my background, my talk about my family. I mean, they're letting me into their, their dinners. They want to know about my family. I I'm providing that I'm providing 
explanation of what I do on a daily basis, what it's like to be a journalist in the hopes that like they'll open up to me and then maybe they'll go to somebody else and say, yeah, you know, you really should meet this person. He's like right now I'm, I'm looking at specific issues like healthcare and mental health. Um, ranchers and farmers are committing suicide at a rate far beyond what veterans are in the U United States. Oh, wow, and yeah. so when I'm dealing with these sensitive topics, even if I know, you know, this person might not be dealing with this topic, maybe they'll know somebody else. And um, if I can show that I have a genuine interest, that maybe they'll say, you know, this you should talk to this person or tell that person maybe you should reach out to them because they really want to start talking about some of these issues that people haven't been talking about. Sure, yeah. You can't, you, like you said, you can't leverage, you can't say, hey, I'm working for the New York Times or, hey, I'm working for National Geographic. Um, you can, but you can say, I really care about this issue and show that you're genuine and, and maybe that will actually even go further than saying, Hey, I've got one day to tell your story for this client and I work for this client. Would you please let me in? So, um, it, when you're working with these people, is it, uh, typically other than the folks at the bar, are you re going back to them on regular basis or is it sometimes, you know? Yeah. Um, there's a couple families that I've spent a lot of time with. Um, so in the beginning, there was a photo of a bunch of people around uh, a dinner table. Yep. Um, that's the Kronberg family. And I, I had met them because I saw sheep and cattle in a pasture. And I was curious why people would do that and whatever. It starts out with a very basic interest. And um, Margot, um, she, a wonderful woman she i i went out with her in a pickup truck and she was driving me around and she some, said something to the effect of like i'm sure you're here because everybody's told you about us and i said well no i just saw that you had sheep and she said oh so you don't you don't know and i said no what are you talking about and she goes well six years ago my husband was killed on an oil field in north dakota and he was trying to make enough money to help support the ranch mm. through the economic hardship mm. and i haven't photographed them a lot but i the last time I was there, I spent some of my last hours in the in South Dakota, sitting down and playing cribbage with them, mm -hmm. and just talking. And I and like this this family, the the Laughlins, um, Max and Eliza, and and their kids, I've spent a ton of time with. The Arneson family, I've spent a ton of time with. You get different parts of the story from different people because they've been experiencing different things. Like the Kronbergs have experienced that loss. Eliza. Um, is a folk singer who lived in New York and moved to the middle of nowhere and met this rancher and became a ranch wife. Uh -huh. I, you, you get different parts of the experience um, by spending time with different people. And, and um, I think that's something that we've done a bad job as journalists conveying as well is it's, it's not a monolith. Like the rural American experience is not coal country. It's not one um, story about opium addiction. It's not, you know, people living in, in trailers further away from cities. It's not a single experience. And so I, I try to spend a lot of time with a few people and then sprinkle in maybe some more time, like with, with my friend Kenny here, who um, a lot of people go roping at a, an arena he built on his land. I'll spend some time with him and then spend some time with somebody else. And maybe it's more time with one than the other, but I try to spread it around so I can get as many experiences and as many stories as possible. And uh, did you find, uh, I mean, it's, I look at a lot of these photos that's sort of mixed with like, you got these groups of people that you're with, you're spending time with individuals, but then there's a lot of like, like one of the last photos was just this sort of lonely, yeah. empty voids of fields. Yeah. And did you find yourself like feeling lonely while you were out on the road? Or did you feel like you were, I mean, of course, now we're all always connected, right? So yeah. it's not that difficult to be in touch, right? I think, you know, the drives to South Dakota, sure. But I I really enjoy having grown up in, in um, Wisconsin and my folks live in a town of 202 people now. So I, I really enjoy being... Um, away from the craziness of, of New York and like feeling like the world is closing in on you in, in some aspects. But you have to keep in mind like places like the bar for everybody there, they're not just a place to go and drink. Like 
first of all, the bar is the only place nearby that you can buy your own, you can buy your own beer, uh-huh. um, which is one thing like, um, but it's also like people work in extreme isolation too. It, it's usually only the people in your family that are working on the ranch with you. And so if you want to socialize, if you want to spend time with people, people spend a lot of time at the bar. And so I think that's the other thing too. I don't feel lonely because I'm always with somebody else for the most part, taking photos. And, and they also seem to, some of them seem to cherish that as well because all of a sudden they've got somebody else, somebody new to talk a to. A new perspective. And, and, yeah. yeah, and and somebody, you know, they'd be working alone on the ranch doing whatever they're doing, and now I'm there with them. Right. Um, I don't know. Cool. I, I really cherish the, like, the one-on-one interactions, the yeah. deep, heartfelt one-on-one interactions, spending time with people. And so I don't think I've ever felt lonely out, out there. But it is, I mean, it is a vast landscape, and you can sort of get lost in the like the the huge vast sky and and you hear the i hear the bison rumbling across the plains at Uh at, uh one of the ranches that i was at and it it, it, that can kind of overwhelm you like the vastness of this place that you're in yeah people that own eight thousand acres or twenty one thousand acres of land that's 30 more 30 percent more land than the island of manhattan that they ranch on that's crazy and so you sort of that the sense of scale is really incredible right so let's go back uh i believe this is the the story that got you started on working towards uh yeah doing now yeah so i was in iowa for three and a half months covering the caucuses and And this is mark's website markkozlerch.com yep people can go check it all out um and i would drive between these events and i i had a lot of fun covering the campaign and i'm i'm hoping to do it again um maybe in a different way but i covered a lot of events and i drive through these tiny little towns like again like off the main highway so away from the mcdonald's and you'd see christmas trees and people's uh people's living rooms lit up at night and Mm -hmm. you'd be like i wonder what's going on there i wonder what's going on in this town that is not is unincorporated and there's like four buildings Mm -hmm. and i i realize like there's a there's a tremendous amount of experiences and lives being lived away from these campaign events and i'd see a lot of the same people showing up to a lot of the same politicians campaign events and like are are we getting an accurate representation of the world that's happening outside of this bubble of this campaign <laughs> sure. event. Are we getting an a- accurate representation? Are the people from those small towns going to these campaign events or is the real story about what America cares about and what Americans think they need, is that actually in these places between A and B? Right. And, and so that's how I sort of started thinking about how can I do a, a rural story and you know, it was just a lot of time spent on the road thinking about that. Um, but I mean, I, I love the theatricality of it. I loved like this was in somebody's garage, um, just very odd and off moments. Uh-huh. Um, and you, when you find those odd moments in the small events and um, you know, at the John Wayne Museum or wherever you are, you, get, you feel like you're getting slightly closer to that authentic experience, but it's still within that bubble. It's still a controlled narrative that they're presenting to you. Right. You've got to work. I mean, that's a challenge as a photographer. You're, you're working around what they want you to photograph and, and trying to find something different. Like, like this, uh, right. Martin O'Malley with his, his bad tick of covering his face when he's like thinking about something. Oh, he yeah. was listening to somebody introduce him and he, he kept doing that. It's, uh, so one of the things that I've, you know, there, I have n- numerous friends like yourself that have over the years covered the presidential campaign trail. Uh, it's one of the things that I wish that maybe I had gotten into and done, um, I guess, before I started a family. And, yeah. and I, um, which, because obviously it takes you away and you're yeah. on the road for quite a while. And it's, uh, but um, do you feel like this is something that you will consider doing again and again? Or do you think it was a one time thing? I mean, I really hope that I'll be able to um, to cover the next uh, presidential campaign cycle. Uh, it's always different when you've got, you know, a lame duck. You you've always got two parties running a ton of candidates. There's a lot more to cover. I don't know how different it is because I've never done um, like it will be. Where uh, although I'm curious, I, I think there might be somebody that primaries the president, and and so that might be 
you might still have a lot of candidates, but I, I want to I want to cover it. But again, I want to do it in a different way. Um, and I've got an idea. I've got a really I think a really good idea. I just don't want to say. Um, but <laughs> want to give it away. Yeah. But I think you know, for people that live in areas where like Iowa, New Hampshire, where the campaign comes through, and it's something that you're interested in doing, and it's a little bit easier. I'd really encourage people to to try, and and the easiest way to do that is find people like like last cycle so two two cycles ago rick santorum won the iowa caucus this last election uh he was like one of the dead last mm -hmm. and if you can find somebody like rick santorum who is an interesting personality and but is not drawing a huge crowd they won't won't really care who you work for or if you show up because there might only be three other people that show up to his event you can really you can make some interesting photos spending some time around the periphery and not the big name candidates i think everybody wants to photograph president trump or hillary clinton or bernie sanders and i spent a lot of time with bernie sanders but um the more interesting stuff was to go around with rick santorum pheasant hunting and have to be ducking out of the way <laughs> while people are shooting guns over my head or whatever yeah, like you can make sure. much more interesting photos that absolutely. way absolutely and more so, colorful yeah um you know did you notice like i'm just just you know generally speaking uh, during this campaign the sort of did you have an idea that that trump was gonna bring it down at this point or so was I, it still I pretty much I up in the air at this point i mean he was drawing huge crowds but my my thought process was okay he's drawing huge crowds Bernie is drawing huge crowds. I don't, th just like on the Democratic side, I, I thought that the um, the institutions would prevent, like the, the Democratic Party and its machinations would prevent Bernie from being, a, a being the nominee. I thought that would happen with Trump. Um, I thought he would tr trickle off i also got this distinct feeling that he didn't actually want to be the nominee and then i got a distinct feeling that he didn't actually want to be president but what he really wanted was somebody to blame for the fact that he didn't win like if he lost he could say well it's because the party was against me right the insiders were against me so i you know at first it was like oh he's not gonna win and then well okay he might be you know he might come close but something's gonna change and I just, yeah. I mean, nobody predicted the, the the election going the way it did, and I didn't. I didn't either. Um, but I also didn't know who would have been the front runner. Like, I ran into Jeb Bush at a, a bar, and I introduced myself and like said it was nice to see him. And and he was so excited because he thought I was a supporter, and he was like, he was theoretically one of the obvious choices for the Republican Party, and he was so excited to have a supporter coming up to him. And then I told him I worked for Reuters, and he got so sad. <laughs> and and to run into Jeb Bush at a bar after hours sure. was very odd. Like it doesn't seem like something that you'd see in a normal presidential cycle. So I mean, it was just all so weird. So and then you you went to the conventions. Yep. And uh, what was that like? The difference? I mean, obviously you've got the extremes of each side at the convention. Yeah. Did you covered both? Yeah, I covered both conventions for for Reuters, and I was. I think I was the only. I was. I think I was the only freelancer like on the floor every day for both uh, conventions for like one of the major wire services. Um, it was. It was definitely different, and um, I think m my editor Jim Borg would s say that I had I had a lot to learn by the end of it. Um, but I. It was weird because I've never covered something where there's 11 or 12 other photographers from the same outlet covering that event from different angles. Mm -hmm. So I'd way overshot. I'd like would see something across the room and be like, I I can't shoot that because that's somebody else's area. I'd get frustrated and then I'd overshoot something boring in my area just to try to make something interesting. Sure. You've got to understand what your what your assignment is. Right. And, I, and it was it was a new experience for me. Um, and it's also got to be a little bit difficult seeing so many other outlets out there. I mean, obviously, as a news photographer, we cover spot news, we cover yeah. politics and whatever that's going on. And, and some of them, there's a lot of people. And you feel like this competition, like you don't want AP to have a photo that you were unable to get. Yeah. Because obviously, 
and you don't want AP to have a photo over across the room that you were unable to get and but then you realize oh wait we have Reuters has somebody right next to that guy and so me running over there doesn't do anything which I, I didn't do but I, like I said I would overshoot and I think afterwards when I look through all my photos I since then I've really cut back my shooting I've had clients be like well, we want you to shoot 3,000 photos on this day and I'm like so you can have 90% of them not be interesting or would you rather just have me shoot a thousand photos yeah. and have 50% of them be good and I think that came out of shooting the conventions and wow being like, that's I a pretty 50% of your thousand well, photos wow not, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> the bar for some clients about of good <laughs> okay. is a lot right 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 lower yeah. maybe uh, not portfolio level, yeah but but usable right? usable yeah, yeah. Um, well anyhow I you know this obviously is is a, an experience that you get to see once every every so many years four years for for the yeah. presidential obviously and and well you, and i think in this cir circumstance especially you know with hillary getting the um the nomination that was like a once in a lifetime thing sure and and despite the fact that like i really i i cherish the the work that i'm doing in south dakota and and r really relish those like more documentary experiences the other the thing that i realized like I covered Michael Cohen's pleading guilty yeah. at federal court two weeks ago, whenever it was. And, um, you know, that's history as well. Sure. And, and so uh, there's the things that I really like doing in my own time. And then there's the things that I get assigned to that I've come to find that I also really, really cherish. Cause I, I, I was sitting outside of federal court and people inside the courthouse were tweeting what Cohen was pleading guilty to um, and and I was reading that aloud to a hundred journalists that were gathered there because nobody knew what was going on and I had this sudden feeling like holy cow like this could be history in terms of this presidency you, you don't know but it, it could be and and so that, that's something that not a lot of people get to experience I mean I, I think it's it surely is history you know yeah. it's no matter what happens at this point you know, it's pretty historic yeah. what's been going on. Um, and also right in our, you know, in our hood, essentially, yeah. it's just happening. 30 minute train ride from my apartment. Yeah. Yeah. Just pretty wild. Well, cool. So what's, uh, what's, what's next? You have like an artist talk coming up, is it? Yeah. So I'm doing an artist talk at, um, at Photoville. So I was, um, Actually, I'm showing work in two different places at Photoville, which is a, a big honor. I've gone to Photoville in um, in Dumbo, uh, in Brooklyn, for the last couple of years, and, and seen a lot of friends with work up. But so I was picked as one of their 12 emerging photographers to have my own little. It's not in one of these big containers. If you've ever been to Photoville, there's these large uh, shipping containers that they put galleries in. Um, interspersed around that, they have four by four foot uh, pallet cubes that they build and they put vinyl wrap with photos around it. So I'll, I'll have one of those cubes, they call it an emerge, emerge cube. Um, and then I'm talking at the Blue Earth Alliance container where I'll have a photo up. Um, I actually just, last week I wanna say, I, I found out that I was accepted into Blue Earth Alliance, which is a nonprofit that helps support documentary photography. Where'd you meet them? Oh yeah. At, uh, <laughs> at uh, Beer and Wings Night. That That's Photo right. Brigade. Photo Brigade they, Beer and Wings they, Night. Yeah. <laughs> Which is another thing that we should talk about is yeah. just networking. You know, yeah. one, of, one of the things that Photo Brigade is big on is networking here in the industry. Pros meeting pros. Mm -hmm. Everybody's doing different things. And we yeah. have events like this at the store here at Adorama, other panel events, and then networking, drinking, wing eating. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, um, you know, you've you've told me because I know you you do work for a wide variety of clients, and one of the things that I for me that's been hard is every client that I've had ebbs and flows. So you know, one year one client will be giving a lot of work, and then the next year the budget will change or whatever. And so I've been trying to get more commercial work, more stuff that like the numbers are a little bit higher, the 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 ask is a little bit different. What, what you're providing them is a little bit different. And that kind of will sustain you between the other things that you're doing. And, right. and you've always said, well, you just hand out your card. You always tell people you're available. I, I think that it, that definitely works. It can be a lot slower than you wish it would be. Sure, yeah, um, yeah. You know, you're waiting a long time, but like I had a PR agency reach out last week because somebody else at their agency 
I had I had photographed for Bloomberg at a Microsoft store, and their their PR person was there, following me around the entire time. Mm-hmm. Gave him my card at the end, and and you know said thanks. And he passed my name along to somebody else at their agency for a different brand. Uh, the shoot didn't end up happening, but like just to be having them reach out. Yeah, and, you and see how that card circulates. Yeah. You just never know the end result. And, and it could it could end up being five years from now. Yeah, it could be five years from now and that brand like that PR company has, you know, dozens of huge brands and so you never know. And I said, Well you asked me if I could shoot this one thing, but just so you know, I also do these other things really well and if you need somebody that does them feel free to reach out and she said, Oh yeah, that's great. That's we always need photographers in New yeah. York. Um, the, the stuff that I've been doing in South Dakota, there's a, a clothing company, Filson, that I've, I really have loved and I've loved what they've been doing on social media. And I was in their store in New York looking for a jacket and I was talking with somebody about the project I'm doing and they, somebody in the store that worked there overheard and said, you should meet our marketing director. He's right over here, the marketing director for New York. Um, turns out they needed a photographer the next week to shoot the redesigned store now I've shot three stores for them. I'm going to shoot a fourth later this year. And they just reached out to me last night about doing another shoot for them. And it's just all because and I put myself out there and in, in yeah, person and, and showed and them my work. also where you are, too. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it also shows that one of, one of the things earlier in my career, I was, you know, my lease was starting to end. I was having to look into new apartments. And, mm-hmm. of course, the rents are so damned high yeah. uh, here. here. And I, I remember talking to my dad. I'm from Ohio, Midwest-ish. Yeah. And uh, saying to him, you know, maybe I should just, you know, move back to Ohio for a year, save that money. You know, you know, I, I will have saved, you know, twenty thousand dollars on rent yeah. or whatever. Um, and he said to me something that I thought was really important. He goes, well, the fact is where you are changes the d- dynamic of who you might meet over the course of that year. Just because of the fact that you're in New York City, you have the opportunity to meet so many more people, more people that could build your career in who knows how many ways. I've met people on the subways yeah. just because I had a camera on yep. or a press pass on and ended up doing yeah, jobs Yeah, that's for happened them. to me too. I haven't done any jobs that way, but I've had people take my card and stuff like that. Uh, so a friend of mine, David Holloway, who's, who's been working in New York for a long time, and um, he told me, he said, well, yeah, you could move back to the Midwest and you could be closer to some of the stories that you want to do in your personal work. You have to keep in mind that New York is like this hyperbaric chamber of time where one year in New York is pretty much like five years in in Nebraska if you were going to be freelancing. Um, I think for people that can make it work when you're starting your career, it's a great thing. I, I really I really admire a lot of friends that are like doing a ton of work in the Midwest. Um, like I look at Maddie McGarvey all the time, mm-hmm. and she's doing a ton of work in the Midwest for huge editorial clients. And I look at myself, I'm like, I don't think I could move out there. Like there's only one Maddie out there. There's only <laughs> room for so many Maddies spread across the United States. Um, and so you've got to balance that with like, okay, is New York maybe the best place for me to be right now to get that amount of experience that she's getting in Ohio? Probably because there's only so many Maddies or Andrew Spears out there too. And, mm-hmm. and um, Danny Wilcox Frazier in Iowa is, I really look up to, but there can really only be one Danny in that region, I sure. think. So, sure. Um, well, they're big, big fish and small ponds or whatever, yeah, whatever that yeah. uh, saying is. So, New York is just a completely different place and it, it can build your career. You just, I'm, I'm not saying everybody can move here and do it. That's the other thing. Like it's not, it's not easy, but if you can somehow make it work, I think there's definitely dividends. Well, that's great. And I think that that's great advice. You know, one of the things I was, I always ask towards the end of the podcast is any advice that you have toward, you know, to people that might be looking, looking up to you to, to try to follow in your footsteps, whether it be here in New York. And I think you, you, mentioned that pretty you covered that pretty well i mean do you I have any other thoughts? i think the one main thing like i said early on was like i'm taking the things that i'm interested in and putting my certain skills both photographically but i also think like ability to connect with people is a huge skill i think that's like 90 percent of what i'm doing um in terms of getting access i i think there's a lot of people that do amazing work um but I think it's an even smaller amount that do amazing work that they really feel strongly about and connect to and have something super important to say. And, and so I think being a photographer is great, but being a photographer who is deeply interested and informed in, on something and, and can contribute to a narrative and, and educate 
and use your skills as a photographer towards that goal, I think is, is really important. So a lot of the photographers that I look up to, like um, Pete Muller, who's a photographer mostly for National Geographic now, um, he is he's a sociologist first i'd say like he's a very intellectual person so i really like i i always try to encourage people figure out what's important to you and what you think needs to be told understand it as best as possible and then be a photographer um i think a lot of people early on in their career maybe do it the opposite way they find something that they think looks interesting and then they try to wrap a story around it Mm -hmm. um and i think what we need more especially in the editorial world is people that are really impassioned about subjects and can tell interesting stories around that subject Mm -hmm. that's important yeah absolutely well i think that's a great note to end it on um mark i really appreciate you coming on uh, again and i do hope that we have an opportunity to to follow up and see you know where this whole Oh, your grant, where, where that goes. I, I didn't ask. So that grant then funds you for a bit? To yeah, continue? so I, I was, yeah, I was working um, out of my own pocket. Uh, I do have to, I'll put this out there. I, I do want to thank um, my cousin, um, Rob Davis, who actually, when I was first thinking about doing a project, he, he said, you know, you seem really passionate about a lot of things and you're just not taking the risk to go do it and I and living in New York it's hard to take a financial risk and he he wrote me a, a small check um at the, for me not so small check but uh, a check and he said here take this money and and go do something that you care about and I, I so I do want to thank him for supporting me and then the rest of that experience has come out of my pocket this grant instead of me spending a thousand dollars on each trip and like making no money this grant gives me like a little bit more reasonable amount of funds to work Mm -hmm. with um just uh, a little cushion yeah yeah, a little cushion for uh, things like when your tire blows and uh in a on a gravel road you know miles from the nearest town or whatever which has happened but um so that grant funds the work and the other person that i do want to want to give a shout out to and thank is molly roberts at national geographic who's one of the senior editors there who throughout the process even before i had the grant i was sending her edits and or wide edits of photos for her to look at and she always said you know I think there's something here. You should keep pushing. And so I do want to thank her for that too. She's now my mentor through this process. You get assigned a mentor. Awesome. Um, so thank you to her as well. Awesome. Yeah. Well, great, Mark. Um, I just want to say thanks again to Adorama, the event space. Uh, thank you to Canon Professional Services and Temba Bags. Uh, please do follow us on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, Mark, you're on all these as well. Yep. Just your name, Mark Kosler, right? Yep. Um, so, you know, check out his work online. You saw his website here. Um, uh, Mark, thanks again. Thank you. All right. We'll see you again next time. Take care. Cheers.